in the Armenian Catholic Bishop House except for one short trip which he made to an Armenian monastery. He said that he couldn't believe anything that he was told by Turks, Kurds, or the Ottoman government, and so he never reported any of it. What he reported was, well, you can imagine, he reported what he heard from Armenians. And what he heard from Armenians was the story that I just told you, the canon. The Kurds had stolen Armenian sheep, the, Arme the Armenians had taken the sheep back, the Ottoman soldiers had come down, there had been the slaughter. He wrote that there was, quote, massacre and pillage, rape and theft, shocking atrocities. 25 villages had been destroyed, perhaps 8,000 were killed, maybe more. How did he know this? He had not seen a single one of the villages. He had not seen any counts of the dead or anything like this. And if you, I think it's rather doubtful he heard that information from the Ottomans, who he said he didn't believe any time. So where did he get the information? He got it from Armenians. There isn't any other possibility. So what we've received, what we've received is the same report in Kars, in Julfa, in Mush, with the council, Howard, the reports that came to Istanbul, the reports that appeared in America, they're all the same story because they're all from the same source. They all come from Armenians. His report, incidentally, I might add, his report, like all consular reports, was supposed to be secret, sent off to Istanbul and from then on to London if the ambassador wished. It appeared almost immediately in various forms in the British press. And indeed, as a serving consul, his letters home describing the exact same thing in the same words were printed almost immediately. Now, I should ask the ambassador, what would you do if one of your consuls wrote home, <laughs> wrote home and the Istanbul newspapers printed everything you said about your administration? You wouldn't be pleased, probably. The British were very pleased. There was no problem at all because, of course, the liberal government was happy to see it. But many times, in the exact same words that Howard used in his report, it appeared in the British newspapers. But also, it appeared in very strange forms. If you believe anything, the Anglo-Armenian Association said that it sent a special correspondent to Armenia. Now, look at what this guy supposedly is. An English gentleman, of course. An English gentleman who speaks the language of the country. They don't mention which one, but this has to be an English gentleman who speaks Kurdish and Armenian. Huh? He, speaks, he went in disguise as a traveling physician. <laughs> Come on! Do you know anything about Eastern Turkey even today? A traveling Englishman. Right? This is like the, the Three Feathers or some, you know, some novel of the old days. But he goes and he asked Christians, I guess he asked Muslims and Christians, and when his reports were brought out, they were Howard's report, right? Even to the same words. Someone had sent them to the Anglo-Armenian Association, but they didn't want to admit that it was a British consul, so they said, well, it was a traveling physician. Right? A certain lack of imagination there. But the British, under a certain pressure, ultimately did publish Howard's report. They published it completely. And the newspapers said that this proves that all they wrote was true, because Hallward said the same thing. Well, of course he did. It was the same story. He said exactly the same thing, and that might have been the end of it. That might have been the end of it, except that the Ottomans, who were very stung by all that was being said about them, the Ottomans set up an investigation commission. And this investigation commission, well, the Europeans said, we can't trust the Ottomans to do an honest job. And so they said, we must set along European observers. Uh, and they did. They sent along British, French, Russian observers. The Americans initially were going to go, then they refused. Uh, they went along, a guy named Shipley, the British, Vilbert, the Frenchman, and, and his name, I can't say it all, Priyavalsky, who went for the Russians. Uh, the world was watching, and these people knew that the report they produced would have to be fairly factual, and they actually did. The unique thing about this commission at the time was that Muslims were actually talked to. They actually interviewed Turks and Kurds. They actually spoke to these people. They didn't just take what the Armenians had said. And the report that they turned out did not exonerate the Turks, didn't say the Turks never killed anyone. What it said was, it, it said was there had been excesses, but they were on all sides. Unfortunately, 
the Europeans didn't care at all about what happened to Muslims. They never reported about dead Kurds that were killed by Armenians. But they did say some very interesting things. And one of them was that the Armenians had started it all by revolting against the government. The first people killed were not Armenians, but Kurds. In other words, the story was completely wrong. And they also said the number of Armenians who died, they didn't care about the Muslims, they didn't count them. The number of Armenians that died were 265. The newspapers had reported 6,000, 12,000, 16,000, 265. And surely at least that many Muslims were killed. Huh? That was all. I might say that later on, the Englishman who was on, who was on the committee obviously got a lot of grief. How could you report this sort of thing? And so even though he had signed on, he said there were 265, a little later he said, well, it must have been more, say 900. Well, politics does even affect diplomats on occasion. But the point is, even if it had been 900, huh? even if it had been all that, the Commission of Inquiry, which is one of the few times, the few times the Europeans actually had looked, more or less exonerated the Turks, surely said what they did wasn't so bad. I might add that there were three commissions, this is completely off the topic, there were three commissions that were set up during this period of time. This commission, a commission that investigated what the Turks had done in Palestine in World War I, and the commission that investigated what the Greeks had done in Izmir in the time of the Independence War. Each of these commissions, the only time the Allies, the only time the Europeans tried to actually investigate what really happened, each of this commission said the Turks didn't do it which is an interesting fact in itself, but not the one we're considering right now. Uh, the Armenians had revolted, but the Europeans, while this commission was taking place, the European newspapers, especially the British newspapers, reported all sorts of complete fabrications about what happened. They printed that the commission is finding that thousands of Armenians have been killed, the commission is finding evidence of rape and murder. The commission is finding evidence of, and it goes on and on and on. Huh? None of it was true. The commission wasn't doing any of those things, but the newspapers printed it all. But then, when the report finally came out, and the Turks were proven not to have done those things, what do you think the newspapers printed? Nothing. I won't go through all the details of what the Armenians had planned, of what was going on, of what actually happened, how they, you know, they burned their own villages and all this. This isn't important. What is important, I'm probably running out of time anyways, right? What? I'll be done quick. What is actually important is, these are the sources upon which the history of the Turks and the Armenians has been written. If you search through the books that tell you what supposedly is the history of this time, and you get past the fact that they all quote each other, and look for what the original sources are, what do they come out to be? Armenians, always. I can't prove it, but my feeling is, my feeling is that all these come from exactly the same source. The missionaries relayed Armenian stories that came from a single source. The journalists were made relayed Armenian stories that came from a single source. Consul Howard relayed Armenian stories from a single source. The same stories and when sources were given, these are sources from just again chosen at random pretty much from British newspapers. Huh? They said, where did this information about these terrible Turkish actions, where did they come from? Well, they came from a letter from a friend. An American who was a longtime resident at Constantinople writes from Harput. Who do you think that could be, if he existed at all? What Armenians were in Harput? Missionaries. I mean, what, Turks, Americans, missionaries. A person who has spent several months of this year in Armenia. An American woman at Constantinople. A reliable correspondence relieved, received in Boston. Interesting. Missionary headquarters from American newspapers. A letter received there in Vienna from Smyrna, Izmir. Uh, a prominent Armenian has received a letter from a friend in Boston. A reliable correspondent, advices from Trabzon, an eyewitness. 
Notice something's missing in any of these. No names. Huh? No identification of any kind. I don't know if they're made up. I think a lot of them probably really were letters that were received from Harpoon. This is very possible. The real question is, why would anyone believe any of this? Then and now, identifying these falsehoods is not a difficult historical task. The lies, the fakes, the ignorance, the prejudice that have formed so much of the belief in an Armenian genocide are not hard to find, as long as we just look. The falsehoods and deceptions that we're going to see in 1915, and about 1915, these didn't begin in 1915. Actually, they didn't even begin in the 1890s. They began long before that. But the 1890s can be a dress rehearsal, considered a dress rehearsal for the falsehoods and deceptions that were to appear in World War I. Given their own prejudices and the deceptions that they were fed by the press, by their missionaries, given these deceptions, it's not odd that our ancestors believed all the terrible things they were told about Turks. But there is absolutely no excuse for us to accept any of those things today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor McCarthy, for this striking account close to the sources. And I am sure that people in the audience would like to pursue some of these issues uh, further. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Okay. So let's begin. Yes, one and then two, please. Yes. You probably should use the microphone because as I get older, my hearing disappears. Uh, thank you very much for uh, all this historical background. But one point which is really uh, would be very interesting for all these young people here. Why did they do it? Just why did they do it? Why did they fabricate all this? It can't be just personal prejudice about some people that they don't like that they see around themselves. And a second question I want to ask, how come some prominent Turks have claimed very recently that we or Turks killed well, Kurds as well as, I, don't, I can't remember the number, 10 million, 100 million Armenians? Well, I can't, the second part I think, yes, somebody, somebody very prominent who got a literary uh, award from a Scandinavian country. Was it the Nobel That's Prize well, or was it Oscars? Was, no, it will be Oscars soon. I, I, about the second part of your question, I can't answer for the motivation of no. colleagues. I don't, you know, you, I suggest but you, whether you agree with you that see or not. Chan, you ask him yourself. Okay. You know, that's all I but can I say. Can't, we can't catch but, him, uh, but about the first, uh, about the first one, uh, this is a time of nationalism. It's a time when everyone believes that their group should have its own country. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was a multinational empire, and nationalism wasn't very common, it surely wasn't among the Muslims, but became so among the Christians, and thus you get Greece and Bulgaria and Serbia and all these countries carved out of the Ottoman Empire. Armenians began to be part of that tradition and part of the revolutionary tradition. Almost all the people who were revolutionaries uh, originally were from Russia, or from Russia and Armenia. They came down. Uh, what they wanted to do was they wanted to create an Armenian. And this, they felt, was the proper thing to do. It was not at all strange to do this in the, in, in the 19th century. It was a very common belief among all kinds of people, including the, the Irish, for instance. It was a very common sort of thing. The immediate way in which they were to do this, however, was very difficult for the Armenians. And that was because they were, in the area they claimed as Armenia, they were less than 25% of the population. Now, it's one thing to create a Bulgaria when your majority are Bulgarians, or Serbia when the vast majority are Serbs, or Greece, but to do a place where three